Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It is Friday, September 14th, and I'm going to do a little video blog update on this weekend's astrology. Plus, we're going to take a look at the upcoming transit between Mars and Uranus. Sort of a big one because Mars has uh, been through a few squares to Uranus and is now completing its final square to Uranus. So this actually has a pretty long history. Um, if you go back, uh, Mars's first square to Uranus began back in May. And uh, that happened right as Mars entered Aquarius and the planet Uranus entered Taurus. The two squared one another right away. Then by late June, Mars turned retrograde, started going backward, eventually went through another square with Uranus. Uh, I think it was right around the beginning of August. And then um, Mars has stationed, turned direct again, and is now um, moving forward into Aquarius, a station in late Capricorn, moving forward into Aquarius and making its third and final square to Uranus. So this is about a long process that we've been um, watching in the heavens for a while now. And we're going to talk mostly about that final stage of the Mars-Uranus <clears throat> um, dynamic today. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening this weekend. What's the astrology of the weekend? It's always a good thing to go into the weekend, sort of knowing, you know, what's going on in the in the sky and how it might pertain to what you've got on the on your plate for the weekend. So, <clears throat> first thing is that um, uh, for the weekend's astrology, basically. Um, well, before I even get into the weekend's astrology, we're coming into a first quarter moon, which is um, part of what I'll talk about. But let's just pause for a minute and uh, recognize the power of the new moon that we just had. If you remember, when I talked about the new moon in a video blog and some written posts last week, uh, we talked about the fact that this new moon, very powerful opposition to Neptune. And we talked about... Um, uh, a lot of different themes along those lines. But we said this is a new moon cycle that's planting a seed and it has Neptune in the picture. It's a very strong opening note from Neptune. Uh, can we not just take a moment to point out the, at least here in the United States, but also abroad, there's many events happening in the collective that always sort of match the description of the um, uh, major celestial events that are happening uh, that's part of our study is to pick up on those things. How about this hurricane that just came through or that's still coming through? Um, I think it's downgraded now to a category one, but it's obviously slammed into the coast here. Um, I have my sister lives in North Carolina. So, uh, you know, it's been it's been on my mind. It's probably people listening. You may know someone you may live uh, somewhere on the East Coast and would have been worried or wondering about what would happen. <clears throat> but what a um, perfect expression on a symbolic level of the new moon opposite Neptune. The Neptune obviously being associated with, you know, water, the oceans, and um, the sun-Neptune opposition is a, is a pretty good image in the sky uh, at this uh, sun-moon, new moon-Neptune uh, opposition. Pretty good image for the... Um, uh, the the great floods and the great waters and the the great surge of um, rain and water and wind coming inward um, that we're seeing right now. So why to point that out? Not just to be like, oh, astrology works. Is I mean, it is. It's really cool. Astrology works. Um, uh, not that you're sitting there and uh, necessarily using astrology every single day to predict the weather. But some people don't know is that astrology is able to be used to predict the weather and has been used to predict the weather for thousands of years. And it's not something I specialize in, but um, I can give you some really interesting examples. So just for fun. So uh, I had a woman in one of my horary classes ask the question, will the weather be good for sailing? So this is a horary as a, as a type of astrology where you ask a question and you, the astrologer is casting a chart for the moment that a question is asked. And then there's particular methods that we use to read the answer. It's not just I'm intuiting the answer based on this chart. It's like a sort of a series of classical rules and techniques that you use to discern the answer. So I said, yeah, you know, weather, weather looks good. Looks like it's going to be great. Um, but I had missed something. Um, 
which was, uh, you know, in brief, if people know this technically, you'll understand, but it was, there was an Antitia from the main signifier to Neptune. And so I thought, I, and I missed it. And um, she said, she, will we be able to go out sailing? Will the weather be good? And I said, yeah, yeah, it looks really good. But I had missed this an Antitia, so sort of secretive conjunction to Neptune. And um, sure enough, they, the weather was great, but they went out and um, ended up getting covered in fog. And uh, so they made it out okay, but they... Um, and I don't remember how exactly this happened. There was the, they went from one area to another area and, and it was um, very early in the morning forecast was awesome. And then they just got shrouded in fog while they went out on this expedition or whatever. So um, <clears throat> at any rate um, that Neptune signature was there and it was a perfect example of a very physical description of what the weather was going to be like in a weather based question simple point is that astrology can describe anything. Um, sometimes we think of astrology as only being relevant to the inner landscape, like my feelings, my emotions, my psychology, my character. And the downside of that is, of course, that what comes with that is sometimes thinking about astrology only in terms of the personal possessives. My, me, my, me, my, me. My Mars, my astrology, my chart, like that. We have to remember is that for ancient astrologers, the practice was um, a little bit more divinatory. Your birth chart could be thought of more as a kind of a technology that's being used, like a, like a wishing pool that's filled with images. And um, the uh, images that speak to you within the parameters of, of the moment that you were born and the place and time that you were born and stuff like that, it doesn't belong to you, right? The technology might be geared toward the moment of, and, and a place of your birth, but the technology is, um, is bigger than us. And so um, it's, I think it's very important to recognize that. And so the, um, the, the birth chart is not to really be thought of as me and mine, at least it wasn't traditionally. And the other thing that, you know, just to sort of dovetail with this point, we can learn that very simply when we take note of how a massive astrological, um, you know, new moon opposite Neptune, this kind of big astrological event, is not just about us. It's not just about me and my feelings and my emotions. You could say on a certain level that it literally signified or indicated um, something to do with the, the hurricane that's happening right now. So when you have that level of awareness of how the astrology is playing out, not just in your life, but you notice things like that around you, you start to become a better reader. So the whole thing with astrology in many ways is that we're learning to be readers. Most of us don't read a lot. Most of us don't really know how to read or interpret signs or symbols. Um, and too often, astrology is learned by just, you know, getting, being, being given a list and saying these are the topics or these are the symbols and, uh, you know, just memorize them and learn to combine them. But uh, it, uh, the real reading of astrology has to do with learning to see this technology as capable of reflecting a huge variety of things. And again, not all of those things are relative to us or our personal internal feelings or process. They can speak to those things, of course, but noticing it in something like a hurricane helps us to broaden our minds and become better readers. So that's a little uh, soapbox I wanted to start off on. <laughs> um, the uh, new moon opposite Neptune for the um, at the start of this cycle uh, is now reaching into uh, the next stage over the weekend, which is the first quarter moon. So the first quarter moon happens every single month. It'll be happening over this weekend. And the best way of thinking about a first quarter moon is that you have a kind of crisis in the, um, in the moon cycle where the sun and the moon are at a square with one another. It's a 90 degree aspect and it's a, a harder Mars-like aspect. And so there's confrontation. There's a moment of yang uh, breakthrough that's trying to take place. The light is waxing on the face of the moon and it's about to become more light than it is dark on the face of the moon. But that takeover, the takeover, the tipping of the scales from 
balanced at the first quarter moon to favoring yang right after the first quarter moon. That's a kind of breakthrough energy and it's establishing, uh, uh, willing something to go through and to dominate or become uh, something is becoming more than it is less of something or the, some kind of uh, asserting energy is happening. So you can notice that on a subtle level, just the, the urge to push the, like that. Um, so that's, but interesting that that's happening while well, the moon is going to be in Sagittarius, which we're, we're, was, is, is the temple of Jupiter. It's a fiery sign, temple of Jupiter. So probably a lot of fire, faith, charisma, buoyancy, optimism, kind of that soaring, flying, imagining, you know, that your, your, your sails are getting filled with wind over the weekend and it's uh, fiery and maybe competitive, like, but it's Sagittarian. And as that's happening, um, the moon is going to square the sun again in Virgo with a very close uh, conjunction taking place between Mercury and the sun in Virgo. That means that you have a Jupiter and Mercury dynamic at this first quarter moon. So best way to read is never to look at the signs and start thinking about Virgos and Sagittarians. That only works on a certain level. It's much better to think archetypally about the planetary rulers of the signs that are getting activated. And what are those planetary rulers doing in the sky right now? So first quarter moon with Jupiter Mercury featured. Um, yeah, there's going to be some tension between mercurial things, interpretation, information, communication, thought, rationality, technical skills or abilities, ideas, practice, administration, um, if implementation of details, etc. Okay, so that's that's our that's our kind of Mercury. But then you have Jupiter, faith, abundance, confirmation, growth, exaggeration, you know, hubris, uh, pride, arrogance. Mercury, you could have uh, rationality, skepticism, and doubt. You have um, belief, faith, optimism, the desire to grow. So these kinds of dynamics between Jupiter and Mercury are going to be more intense over the weekend, just briefly, it's just a couple of days. Um, but then, even though there's some tension between those things, we look at the rulers. What's happening to the rulers right now? Well, Mercury exalted and in its own rulership in Virgo, very effective right now. It's in its own chariot, which means it's also protected from combustion to the sun. So if you know about combustion, you don't have to really worry about that so much with Mercury in its own sign. Um, and then it is moving into a sextile with Jupiter in Scorpio. So... What does that mean? It means that Mercury and Jupiter can get some stuff done. That tension over the weekend can amount to some positive changes. It's a great weekend, in other words, for there to be both a kind of meticulous, rational or analytical quality, communicative quality, intellectual quality, and a sort of faith-based, expansive, growth-oriented, big picture kind of quality. And those two things are really supporting one another right now, even though there may be some tension. It has more of the feeling of a productive, creative tension because of the sextile that's happening between those. Sextiles are, of course, of the nature of Venus. So a sextile is there so there's support over the weekend is the basic idea for mercury and jupiter things to come together so uh, i'm going to look and see if there's any questions about that my moon is in sag will this help alleviate my recent downturn of events in my life it's been crazy it's hard to say exactly what might be causing that right i mean first and foremost the planets aren't causing any of it but what the planets are indicating um you could think of the plant uh, planets more like um the uh, uh, something that you'll hear astrologers say a lot is like the, the hands of a clock. The planets are like the hands of a clock and they're telling you, you know, what the karmic time is and what kinds of things are going to be flowering in what areas of life, what themes at different times. They're just, they're in a sense, they're just telling you what's unfolding in the realm of time and space, which is the sort of the karmic realm. So they're just telling you what's unfolding um, but as those transits interact with your chart and there's different timing techniques and so forth, there's a, such a huge variety of things that could be uh, blossoming in your life right now that it would be hard to uh, say exactly what this weekend would do for you because you might be going through a really intense Pluto transit or you might be going through, you know, um, who knows? You, you could be going through any number of really 
um, intense karmic seasons right now, in which case this little window of events over the weekend may not really um, hold a candle to the larger picture of what's happening in your chart. It may not be that significant at all what's happening this weekend. Um, it depends. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes, you know, when, when these, like, for example, if you have Jupiter in a really prominent place in your chart right now, making a, a big deal in your chart, con conjoining the midheaven or your ascendant or descendant or, or whatever, conjoining a big planet in your chart, then this Mercury Jupiter sextile can be a big deal. So that's why you need an astrologer to look at it very carefully. Um, and these transits that I report on are really better used in terms of just being like, what's happening over the weekend? Where can I see the themes playing out? And then, you know, it might be more for some people, less for other people, depending on kind of the nature of their own personal karma. So that's a, uh, uh, so, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. And good morning. So many nice good mornings. Good morning, everybody. So uh, that is the week. That's what I want you to pay attention to over the weekend. Um, next, what I want to talk about, really the sort of the big thing that I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, oh, you know what? One more thing. I had one more thing on my list with uh, Mercury and Jupiter that I forgot to mention. This is one other thing for Jupiter, uh, Mercury and Jupiter coming into a sextile while the first quarter moon highlights uh, the signs of Jupiter and Mercury. Um, there's also the ability to take what you're, like let's say you have a set of beliefs, spiritual beliefs, um, political beliefs, whatever, some kind of philosophical orientation. It's a good time when Mercury and Jupiter are getting together and there's some tension for figuring out how to make your beliefs, how to put them into more effective practice or how to make sure that you're like, it's a good moment to sort of refine your craft or sharpen your tools so that the day to day level of what you do matches up with the bigger picture of what you believe and where you believe where you're trying to go with your life. Like, that's a simple way of thinking about it. Okay, that was the last point that I wanted to make. Now we're going to talk about Mars approaching its final square to Uranus. I said this at the beginning, we'll say it one more time. Mars has squared Uranus a bunch. So Mars squared Uranus uh, from in Aquarius to Taurus um, at about the middle of May, did so again about the beginning of August, and now it's doing so again about the middle of September. It'll be exact on the 18th. So it's coming up, it's applying, you should be feeling it already. And we've talked, I've talked about this at length the, the first two times it did it as well. I'm not gonna speak about it uh, in, in the same, uh, I'll try to say some new things. Um, first of all, this is a very, just the very basic thing is that this is about a process. The whole Mars retrograde, you know, time is about a process of redefining or refocusing our will, our sense of direction, our desires, our sense of purpose, our relation to anger, irritation, frustration, confrontation, like that. Uh, when you pair that up with the whole Mars retrograde was an orb of a square to Uranus. Uranus is the paradigm breaker, the rebel, the innovator. Uranus likes to think outside of the box. Uranus is eccentric inspiring, um, rebellious, defiant, uh, an iconoclast, but Uranus is also progressive, future-oriented, about emancipation, liberation, sudden or shocking events, disruption. So when you put those two together, and then you say, okay, I've been working on these Mars-related themes for a long time, uh, you know, good, probably about half the year by the time Mars is actually done through uh, the same degrees as um, uh, it goes all the way through Aquarius. Uh, then you pair it up with Uranus and you think, not only have I been working on, you know, anger, will, frustration, um, et cetera, but I've also been thinking about, I've also been figuring out how to use my will in order to create um, significant changes in my life or where I've been trying to create significant changes, but I've been blocked or frustrated in doing so or in accomplishing the results that I want. 
Or you can say that there's been a very strong theme of the desire for independence, for greater freedom, and different kinds of ideas and limitations surrounding what can or can't be free, what has to be restricted, where there's obligation, where there's duty, um, where we can experience greater independence, where we're feeling blocked from greater independence, where there is a drive to create something or invent something new or think about the future, and yet uh, what are the practical limitations to, to getting there? So Mars and Uranus has, um, you know, again, been going through quite a, quite a process. When the two planets get together, uh, the worst case scenario um, is that there is some impulsive and reckless drive to progress at all costs. So let's just talk about that for a second on a kind of spiritual level. Um, one of the things that really defines, in some way, sort of defines the modern era, and sometimes much of modern astrology, is the desire to uh, progress. Everything is thought of as becoming better and better and better on all different kinds of levels, humanitarian, political, technological. Um, and we think to ourselves, everything new is better. And this has been something that has been happening for a while now. And could we talk about there being measurable results that demonstrate that things have gotten better in different areas like technology or standard of life or standard of living in certain areas or standard of treatment for different kinds of people or whatever. Yeah. Like there's sort of measurable results that we can say, oh, look, look at how much we're progressing. But one thing that ancient astrologers believe that we often forget is that time was cyclical which mean, me, meant that there were light ages and dark ages, that there were long periods of expansion followed by periods of contraction, that where there's a sort of yang, historically speaking, then there's yin. So we have to be very careful because sometimes in the drive for progress and our, our sort of future orientation and even, the, even spiritually, this emphasis on ev evolution, evolving, um, that when there's a kind of goal-based, future-oriented uh, way of thinking, that we, we really sort of start stepping out of our relationship with the Tao. You know what I mean? We start, we start stepping out of our, a deeper understanding of the way that material things cycle and change. For example, mo many of the greatest elements of progress in the modern era, scientifically, technologically, politically, et cetera, have also come at the cost of uh, killing or annihilating or harming people or things that are also sacred and arguably maybe more evolved. So for example, French and American revolutions for as revolution as they are, as they are, are bloodbaths, uh, industrial revolution and uh, scientific revolution are great, but they also in some ways desacralize and demystify the, um, are they, they, they strip away the spiritual relationship to nature and to life. And so what we've progressed, uh, in, is, is it so much of a surprise that we're getting like super hurricanes like every other week or whatever? You get the point that where there is this idea of progress and worshiping at the altar of the future, there is also often a kind of a recklessness and um, a, a tendency to forget the past. And the past and the present and the future in astrology are sort of all co-present with one another within, because remember, ancient astrologers had a more cyclical view of time. And so where time is moving in cycles like this, cycle after cycle after cycle, contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion, um, and, and vacillating between the d d different dualities. Um, if we keep that in mind, then we start to redefine what we mean when we talk about progress or what, we, what constitutes real progress. And what is that? You know, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly you know, what that is, but what, what I can say is that this entire Mars retrograde cycle since mid-May has in many ways been about progress, limitations to progress, frustration with the status quo, 
the intense desire to make change, the futility uh, of making changes, the pride and arrogance of, of change, uh, the, and the, the recklessness or disregard, the losing touch with um, uh, the, a, a more earthly reality that what goes up must come down. We can lose touch with that during this whole Mars cycle. We can also learn. We can also go through a process of elevating our hopes and expectations, coming up with all these ideas about how we want to progress, and then going through a period where we have to refine and reflect on those things and go like, okay, well, how much of that is practical? How much of that is rooted in selfishness? How much of that is actually being of service to others of the world? How much of that is going to actually fulfill me or make me happy? Um, again, so the, the whole process hopefully has allowed us some opportunity to reflect on the difference between that sort of, you know, that, that Icarus or Promethean version of, um, progress, where you might fly too close to the sun, or you may end up being punished by the gods, um, because of hubris and, um, being able to reflect on that some, somewhat this final pass has the power to be about implementing changes that can create a new paradigm or that can help us make a breakthrough or, or you know, achieve greater independence or uh, do something new and progressive. But hopefully now this last time we're making those changes or we're going after whatever we're going after tempered by what we've learned, you know, having hopefully integrated some lessons and ready to make changes that uh, do not represent that incredible arrogance of, of forward progress and evolution and momentum and everything like that. So um, the other thing to remember is that um, things are, are temporary here. So one of the things that we also forget when we're in progress, breakthrough, you know, ass assertive kind of spaces like Mars, Uranus, is that the things that we achieve with our will are temporary, um, most of them. So like, for example, you might be raring to go with a new business concept or with, you know, uh, a new relationship, or you might be ready to quit your job or, you know, like make some move basically disrupt the status quo. Uh, or you might just be in a mood, a mood or mode of, challenging things or feeling like you want to challenge someone or something. Uh, what do we achieve by doing that, right? I've learned that, um, like, for example, in social media, when you feel like challenging someone or you just feel like resisting or defying the norms or, or being combative or whatever, that uh, the result that you achieve may be a little bit of self-satisfaction for having won an argument or major point you know, or stood up for yourself or something like that. The result's very temporary. It doesn't last very long. We feel hollow again very quickly. Um, similarly, if you apply all your energy to new things in career, business, relationships, workplace, whatever, uh, I, I often am just disappointed by how, uh, how short-lived the results are. Or how I don't really want what I have after I've gotten it. You know, so sometimes people are like, well, I'm just, I got this Mars, you know, this Mars Uranus energy is coming through. I'm going to make these big changes. It's all about progress. It's all about redoing things. There's a stand I have to take or something like that. And um, uh, whatever we get, we, once we have it, we don't want it. It's difficult to maintain, or we have to start dealing with the inevitable process of losing it. And uh, that starts happening mentally, emotionally. As soon as we get something, we start thinking about how to maintain, how to keep it. Eventually that starts you know, deteriorating into uh, how, how am I going to lose it? How am I going to deal with losing it? Um, so ancient astrologers also, Stoics, Platonists, Yogis, etc. All of them also had very similar views of why we're using astrology. We're not using astrology so that we can know like, oh, there's a Mars Uranus transit. Great. Go kick butt, take names and progress, you know, because they were like, yeah, well, progress is followed by regress. So the point of studying this is uh, at times, like it's just uh, the planets are indicating something about our destiny. We're going to have a Mars Uranus like moment over the next days. 
the next week. We're going to have a big breakthrough, a big surge of creative, defiant, original energy. Fine, that might happen. But the astrology is there not so much to amp us up about what we can get from the energies, but it's more about being aware of where they are and where they're going because there will be a contraction that will come after this. You know what I mean? Who knows which planets will represent that, but there will be one. Whatever this is, it will eventually be followed by, you know, the same energy that goes out coming back in. The astrology is here to teach us about that. And it's here to teach us about the kind of peace that we can have in our lives when we start tuning in to that level of what the planets are saying. So, um, all the dualities of the planet, like expansion, Jupiter, contraction, Saturn, why are they all comprised of dualities that keep just cycling endlessly? Because that's what we're supposed to be learning about. We're supposed to be learning about who we are in relation to that. It turns out that who we are is something that doesn't cycle like that. Who we are as a conscious, eternal, living soul is, in a sense, doesn't have anything to do with any of that. So how do we, but here we are in this place where that's what's happening. So how do we have a relation to that that's conscious? That's what the language is trying to teach us. So that's why we study these transits, not so much from the standpoint of, um, again, what can I, how can I use this to create the breakthrough that's going to give me everything that I want? Um, remember that the other thing that's very important is that Mars is all about will. So there's something always in every Mars transit that's teaching us about will, willpower, force, desire, drive, aggression, competition, cutting or dividing things, separating things, analyzing things, saying no to things, cutting them out like that. Um, so Mars has that kind of energy. It's a fierce, right? <clears throat> This also gets into free will. We often mistake that kind of will, that demonstration of will, the kind of muscle of will. We mistake that for the idea of free will, of being a free agent or of having a conscious choice or agency as a soul. We mistake the two frequently. Um, so what constitutes free will? Like what is that really? Here's a way of thinking about it. Um, you can think about um, free will or you can think about fate really as sort of, um, they're, they're really aspects of one another. So um, in a sense, everyone loves the word destiny. Nobody really likes the word fate. Etymologically, they have more in common than they are dissimilar. Um, but the idea of fate is that there's something that's going to happen that you have that you can't do anything about. Yeah, um, here's the best way of thinking about how free will relates to fate in that sense. If I take a baseball and throw it as hard as I can against a glass window, there is nothing that I can do about it. That glass window is going to break. So in that sense, I chose to choose to throw a baseball like right at a window, and then there is an inevitable consequence as a result. That's really what ancient astrologers thought of um, in large part when they were thinking about fate and free will. Fate is the culmination or the reaping of what's been sown. Uh, fate and um, to a certain extent destiny, I'll talk more about destiny in a second, fate has a lot to do with what you've done with your free will and your the, the feeling that we have in this lifetime that like certain things are out of my control and they're faded and we get scared about that the thing that we forget because we're highly unconscious is that though we have made choices prior to being born into this body because who we are is not just this body. And so because of that, we forget. And so then we become uh, afraid of certain kinds of things that are going to happen in our life that feel like they're outside of our control, like someone rear ends you. Well, I didn't consciously do that. So we say, if someone says, well, it was faded, then immediately you think, this is just bad random stuff that's going to happen. I don't want to live in that kind of a world where it's just like guaranteed bad stuff. And it seems, well, no, the, <clears throat> it's much more complicated than that. What we're saying is that karmically speaking, your karma fits the bill for playing the role in the unfolding of the material re reality at this moment that includes two cars getting into a fender bender. 
your karma designates you for playing that role right now. But um, that karma comes from a series of choices that we've made with free will over a very long period of time. That's the idea. And it, what you have to understand is that 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 is the basic operating program of fate and free will. Here's where people get really confused. They say, well, then well, where is my free will? If everything is just coming from previous choices, then how is there any new or original choice? But the thing is that they exist simultaneously. That's really hard for us to fathom. So, um, for example, you could be um, walking down the street and you could stub your toe and really hard and, you know, you know, whatever. And um, then your reaction to that event with your own free will could be to, you know, I don't know, scream out the F-bomb in front of a kid, right? <laughs> like, not a good, not a nice thing to do. But you could, you could have some kind of reaction like that. <clears throat> and the point is that there's always a, a combination of events that are culminating or that are cropping up um, from past choices while there are also at the same time new choices being made. So the combination of fate and free will is always working together like that. And so we are in the process of making many choices as a free agent that will determine outcomes in the future and that um, create very immediate outcomes and very long-term outcomes. And we're also reaping the, um, the karma or action that has been sown in the past. Okay, now the way that's orchestrated is not just about a literal, mechanical, physical cause and effect. Primarily, it is spiritual, which means that the every instance of karma is built in with an opportunity for us to start recognizing the, the, the wisdom associated with the kinds of actions we've chosen and the kind of results that have come. This is why sages have generalized the learning as follows. When you do this long enough and you start taking notice of how choices lead to consequences, what you start to realize is that all choices that are based on the desire for something in this world that is temporary lead to dissatisfaction. That is one of the, the broadest things that all ancient mystics sort of agree upon. When you do things in this world just based on getting something that's temporary and you spend a lot of energy doing it, getting it, whatever, that when you have that thing, it eventually goes away and it doesn't feel good. And so the real use of free will, according to a lot of different mystical traditions, has something to do with learning to train your mind, train your body to not react adversely to ups and downs, and to start creating choices that create more peace, balance, harmony, um, and uh, that you, you start looking for a, um, not so much a, a sense of what can I get, but you look more about how can I align myself? How can I become a part of an instrument of the divine where there's an intelligence that's flowing through all of these ups and downs that's here with us? And it becomes about how do I use my will in service to that? And that's not easy. It's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing because it's different for everybody because this thing is moving. It's ever new. It's ever present. It's ever fresh. It's uh, the divine the divine Leela, the divine play um, is asking us to play our part, not in terms of achieving something, but in terms of becoming someone or something, becoming conscious and being a part of it. That's not easy to do. That's just ridiculously hard to do for people who are driven toward temporary results all the time, right? Because then what we tend to do is make spiritual goals into a, another temporary goal. So it's like, well, and then we've talked about this in other talks that I've given, like we think to ourselves like, well, if I get the yoga certification or if I, you know, if I get the PhD in Jungian studies or if I have a successful astrology practice or whatever, then that sort of is a, is a thing that I can stand on. It gives me some sense of uh, having arrived spiritually, but those things fall away too. You know what I mean? Those things fall away too. So the what we're looking for is a way of being not something that we get. And that's, it's very, that's a difficult thing. Okay. So back to Mars taking, that's a whole, like take that as a whole kind of metaphysical conversation. Mars is not your free will. People think all that Mars is your will. 
more often than not, I'll just say this generally speaking, more your free will is who you are. It's not a planet. You're, you're, as a conscious soul, your free will, first and foremost in this material world, because we aren't our actions and we aren't our bodies, is where am I placing my focus or attention? Where am I placing my energy? Where am I placing, uh, you know, where, where do I direct my conscious awareness? And where I direct my conscious awareness trickles down through the material matrix and starts creating actions, right? Um, Mars might tell you something about the kinds of actions that you're taking, especially those that are driven by a more intense hunger, desire, need, want, like, you know, like that. So, but um, that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that that's your will. More often than not, in other words, Mars represents your whims, meaning your hungers, your appetites. And so when we look at Mars in a chart, a lot of times we try to dress it up and be like, oh, it's your will. It's your, it's your inner warrior, you know, like that. I'm not opposed to being like, yeah, there's an inner, there's an inner warrior or, or whatever. Um, but, but frankly, none of us really know what it means to be a warrior. I mean, I'm just going to be totally honest about that. A simple example, and I, I say this to myself, we don't, a lot of us don't know what it means to be, um, I mean, some people have really unique ex life experiences. I'm talking about your everyday like warrior. Again, uh, something we're doing at our yoga studio coming up this month is a 21 day sugar cleanse. Just a simple thing, right? You know, try, try, try giving up or saying no to your hunger for sweet treats for 21 days. There's like the vast majority of like consumer, um, you know, like American population is like has an IV of sugar just going right into them, right? Including myself sometimes. I go through streaks where I'm just like eat too much sugar. But the point is that um, it is very hard not to be driven like Mars, driven by those desires. Try unplugging yourself from sugar for 21 days. It's very, very, most people, especially in I, we have our yoga studio, most people really, really struggle with that. And yet, how often are many of us who couldn't say no to sugar for 21 days in a row or who couldn't demonstrate a daily spiritual practice of any kind, what to speak of, uh, you know, uh, really digging down and, and learning how to change f f core behavioral uh, issues that we have on any level, um, uh, how many of us are constantly posting things about how empowered we are, what a, what a spiritual warrior we are, like that. So I'm, I'm being a little, I'm being a little harsh, but you know what I mean. It's that, it's um, w w that is mistaking our will for our whims. The real will is very, very hard to cultivate because what we talk, we're talking about when we talk about real will is being really in touch with yourself as a conscious being that has that has the freedom to choose where it places its attention. Most of the time, we're not aware of the radical degree to which we don't have control over where we pr place our attention. So I'm, I like, I really appreciate Jim Carrey was saying the other day in uh, watch a documentary about him and Andy Kaufman. And uh, he was method acting Andy Kaufman in the film man on the moon. And one of the things that he said was, he said, I'm not a, I'm not a big believer in, um, in free will. But he kind of qualified that, and he said this in other talks too. Um, one of the main reasons that he's not a big believer in free will is because he believes that it is very, very difficult for people to not be driven unconsciously by stuff that they pretend to understand. And I feel the same way, and studying astrology, I feel the same way as I use it to reflect on my life and the life of the people that I serve and what have you. So I'm not saying all of that to uh, suggest that we don't have free will, but that to actually have a conscious relationship with ourselves as free agents um, is very, very extraordinarily difficult work. Um, you know, so when you look at a Mars transit, a lot of what you end up looking at is not so much your free will as much as it is your, uh, uh, your whims, your desires, your appetites, and how they're driving your boat right now, usually in terms of things that you want in the material world that are temporary. That's why Mars was traditionally called the lesser malefic. Mars is a planet that is excessively hot and fiery in nature. And so 
if you really want to have a relationship with a Mars transit, you have to be willing to look very authentically, not so much at your will, your power, your spiritual warrior, but more at where you're being driven, where you have a very hard time demonstrating any, uh, you know, level of uh, control or temperance or where your hungers are, are, are pushing you in a direction that you don't have much say over. If you can be honest with yourself about those things, even just that honesty that is actual, to me, that's where the spiritualization of Mars comes in. That's where you can start to say, okay, I'm, I am uh, at sometimes I'm a prisoner of my desires. And when I'm aware of that, when I'm honest with myself about that, there's a little bit of space between me and those desires, even if it's just a little bit of space. And that to be that honest with ourselves is brave because the typical move, and I'm guilty of this all the time, is that we say, in, instead of saying, um, this is honestly where I'm being driven, what I want to do, what I want, da, 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 like that. Instead, we start making excuses, justifications, we get angry, we get belligerent, we get resistant, we get rebellious. Suddenly, we're leading the French Revolution of our own, you know, our, our need to justify ourselves. And then, and then, you know, we're great spiritual warriors and we've got quotes up on our wall from Rumi and the whole thing explodes from there into a massive display of spiritual arrogance because really we all, you know, really we're all, we're all struggling with this. So um, the, but the, but the point is that even, and this is something that's over the course of the history of astrology, Mars has also been looked at as the bravery of the martyr. Now, the martyr is obviously, there can be like a martyr complex, but, you know, a, a, a real martyr is someone who will die for a cause, right? Someone who will, who will give their life for a cause. There's something selfless, right, about real freedom. And that's, that's really hard for us to comprehend. But that's actually where the spiritualization of Mars rests. It's in sort of saying, um, my needs, my desire, my drive, my hunger, my competition uh, for the things that I want is not the most important thing in the world. What can I be in service to? And something d truly daring grows inside of us when we ask that question and go in, in that direction of service. And then we stand a chance to be brave. We stand a chance to be free. We stand a chance to have used our, our directed our, our attention, or our consciousness more intentionally like that. The other thing that Mars struggles with is Mars says, I know, I know best. Like I'm in charge here, I know best. I know what to do, what, you know. Another thing that's like such a, there's such a modern, you know, in, in the you know, sort of modern new age world, we love to talk about the occult, like things that are hidden, hidden mysteries, like what's secretive or, or whatever. Here's a real mystery. And this is in, in my, again, my humble opinion. Here's a real mystery. We don't know what's really the best for us. To me, that's the most fascinating and mysterious thing possible, that I don't know what's best for me. I don't know exactly what I need or what I should desire in this material world whatsoever. I know uh, some very basic things from my spiritual path thus far that I can say, like, for example, that the goal of being a bit more selfless, a bit more humble, a bit more of a servant, that sounds good. What exactly does that look like? How do I do that? How do I make all sorts of difficult decisions, etc.? What do I really want? What is what? What should I really be doing? To me, the 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 most audacious, brave prayer is: I have no idea what I want or what I need or where I'm going. Please offer me help and guidance. Please show me what I should be doing, or please show me the path. Um, but how how often do we, you know, we sit down and we craft out our vision for the future or we sit down and we say, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to go do and I'm going to go get it because I believe in myself and da-da-da-da-da. There's nothing wrong with, you know, setting some intentions and having a, a, a goals and dreams in our life, right? But how oriented toward dreaming and goal setting and achievement and in personal empowerment do we have to get before we return to that amazingly mysterious, sacred uh, place of, I don't know what's best for me. I don't, I don't know exactly why I'm here, where I'm going. There's something very profoundly brave about 
praying that prayer, right? Um, another prayer that I was taught one time to pray in the midst of an ayahuasca ceremony, right? Um, but one of the um, uh, shamans, I was incredibly terrified, just so overwhelmed by what I was experiencing, these incredibly uh, vast and um, uh, dark uh, dimensions of reality and of my own mind and and so forth. And um, I said, I don't know what to do. And basically, uh, his comment was, um, I don't know, I don't know how to cope with this. And his comment was, ask for more. Like, what? Like, what are you, you know, was, he said that it sounded crazy to me. And he said, ask for more. Just tell the universe, you know, right now, just kind of speak your mind Just say, I don't know what's going on. But um, I, I don't, and I'm not getting the message. But just pour it on. So I get there. Just, just pour it on because I I trust you and I trust this whole process. I trust my nature. I trust what I am. So just give it to me. Just show me what I need to see or just take me where I need to go. I'm in your hands. So that prayer of total surrender is the same kind of thing that you see, you know, like classic warriors like Obi-Wan Kenobi when he just lifts his lightsaber and just lets Darth Vader slice him down. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Where you see that that image of the uh, t just total surrender into the overwhelm of the situation that we're born into or that we're dealing with on a battle on the battlefield of life. That's also Mars. You know what I mean? Like that that we can see Mars sort of a spiritual Mars like that. And that's that's a bravery of Mars that we don't often recognize. I wanted to say all of this today because so often when we talk about, yeah, there's, you know, Mars, Uranus, like I go down the list, there's going to be a spiritual or there's going to be a, you may have to like assert yourself, defy authority, have a breakthrough. There might be more forceful, excited, young kind of energy coming through. And like, yeah, that's going to play out in a myriad number of way in all of our lives. And it's going to, it's because our, we have karma that's in momentum. It's that stuff's going to happen. But with this kind of, the reason that we meditate on this is the same reason that ancient philosophers and mystics meditated on these exact same things. Because by meditating on them, we bring that awareness with us into the events and we start the whole event space becomes, uh, it becomes translucent, it becomes multidimensional, and it becomes an opportunity for us to remember our divine nature and our relationship with our divine source. So that's what I have for you guys for today. Um, I hope that this was interesting and uh, let's see if there's any questions. Yeah, exactly. Julie's saying I'm there right now. What do I want to do? I will ask for more. So how many times, well, you know, how many times per week do I hear someone come in and say, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Um, what am I supposed to be doing? And that one of the bravest things we can do is actually ask that question, like, just be like, I'm looking for some guidance. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, I'm not the expert here. Yet what is most of our, I was watching a marketing video yesterday because I'm trying to learn a bit more about um, editing YouTube videos because I have this YouTube channel that I put this on. And I was watching something and I was like, wow, this, the whole tone of the speaker who was talking, everything was about just results. So much certainty about what you want your outcome to be. What is your, what is, you know, what, what, what are you trying to have happen here? And here's how to get it done. Like that's, that's basically something we're inundated by all the time through advertising and the advertising is getting increasingly more sophisticated. Why? Because advertisers are realizing, oh, well, this doesn't work anymore. Of oh, This model doesn't work anymore. You have to be clever. You have to, you have to, speak more to where people are really at. So you see, the, but the advertising is still trying to sell you something. And so at the end of the day, more and more and more of our authentic responses to inauthenticity are being co-opted to try and sell us something. So it's like we're, in a, in a sense, the advertisers are doing us a favor because we our, our basic response to advertising can get just a little bit more simple, which is just turn the damn thing TV off. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I think that response is coming from more and more people just turn the technology off because 
they're, all they're doing is finding more ways to try and get in your head with the honest reaction that you're having to advertising. So they're getting more and more subtle and manipulative with your emotions, with your philosophy, with your spiritual beliefs. They're, 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 they're still, they're just tinkering around in all of it. And it gets more sophisticated like that. So I had that observation, you know, yesterday and I was just saying, gosh, it, isn't it one of the th most healthy things for that, you know, people in that world just to stop and go, wait, what if I don't actually want any of this stuff? What if it doesn't take me anywhere that's good? And in which case, what do I really want? Why am I really here? But that destiny comes for all of us eventually. And usually, how does that happen? It happens through frustration of the will, which is part of what we've been through. And part of what this, I think, opportunity of Mars, Uranus reflects on a spiritual level, so ability to awaken beyond just the level of uh, gimme, gimme, gimme the outcome. I remember ancient astrology, many of the texts were called apotelismatics. It was a common name for textbooks of astrology, which means the study of outcomes. You don't, you know, in a sense, it's like, think, think about that, right? It, these are people whose primary philosophy was about equanimity in the highs and lows of fortune, and yet they were studying outcomes. The Sri Isha Upanishad, which is a famous Upanishad from the Indian tradition, says that uh, basically the only way to progress in spiritual life is for people to progress uh, both in terms of learning and understanding spiritual reality while hand in hand learning about the darkness of the material world. That's what ancient astrology was really about. It was about studying. The, the astrology was about studying, in a sense, the world of nescience and unconsciousness and just the, the turning of the world of fortune and just studying it, just being a student of it. Because when you pair that with study of spiritual things, it's very, it can be very, very enlightening. But that's a totally different philosophy than philosophies in many ways that say, renounce the world, just chuck it aside. Astrology is not a chuck the world aside kind of practice. Astrology is a practice that says you, you have to advance by, by, you can't help but be human and live out your karma by your destiny but you do so you have to do so hand in hand and astrology helps you with that so at any rate um you don't have a tv freedom yeah see that's what i mean okay <clears throat> let's see i'm going up through questions i heard david cochran the other day and he was talking about the essence of each sign and of aries ruled by mars he said it is honesty um, yeah, I think you could you could say that there's something in Mars that really appreciates um, honesty. I'd say that that's often reflected in the kind of the idea of um, that your 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 blade, your will, your you know your your desire body, and that hunter in you um, is best used in service. To me, that realization is the ultimate form of honesty. So I could get down with that. Let's see. Um, the, there's a massive ego around being the spiritual warrior these days. I mean, it's low-hanging fruit, right? Like part of what I do is I just pick on things that are easy to pick on in the new age. I don't want to get it wrong though. Like I'm not here to just be that guy who picks on stuff that's easy to pick on and prop myself up or something like that. There's value in the idea of being a spiritual warrior for sure. And I, I you know, I have I appreciate that people are trying. I'd rather people be talking about spiritual warrior than be eating Big Macs. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's all things are in context. But anyway, um, I detest sugar, poison, and try not to ingest any, but there are hidden sugars all over. Yes, there are, yeah. Uh, that's right, it does It does sneak in. And and we have, again, like we learn about the material world by interacting with it. We These are... So the process of learning about nescience, the darkness of the material uh, space and its impermanence, we learn about spiritual things as we go through the material things. But this is a realm that is instructive. You know what I mean? It's like everything is instructive for us in this, in this realm if we have eyes to see it. So anyway, uh, let's see. Okay, so that's um, what I've got. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think I, earlier I said that I would mention something about destiny and the difference between fate and destiny. Um, so usually the the basic difference between the two is that um, destiny is thought of more in terms of the ability to 
uh, well, the phrase destiny is negotiable and, and you have the other phrases sort of fate is non-negotiable. So here's how I like to think of this as well. This is actually really important. Our choices now are both retroactive and forward active. Um, I have a friend of mine, a, a good friend named Eric, uh, Eric Wargo, and he just wrote a book called Time Loops. Uh, he's a scientist, a really brilliant guy. And he wrote a, he wrote a book about the, um, it's, about, it's basically about precognition, and it's about how uh, time has, is his hypothesis, which he explains in great depth, detail, and lots of stories, is that the, there are time loops that are always happening. And this is really in line with, again, what ancient astrologers believed as well, that time is cyclical. Um, and uh, one of the things that we don't realize is that choices we make now have the power to affect previous karma as well as future karma. So in other words, actions are not just singular, they're not just one directional. Actions don't just emanate from us toward the future. They also emanate backward into the past. And so it is very true. And it, it, okay, two things, one, can you change your fate? Yes and no. Um, you know, if I, let's just give you a simple example. If I roll a baseball toward my front door and the front door is open and I roll it at a very slow speed, in a sense, I have a chance to run, catch it and stop it before it goes out. Whereas if I hurl the baseball as hard as I can out the door, I'm not going to be able to catch up with it and grab it before it goes out the front. And that's a very, very primitive um, and sort of ineffective metaphor. But the idea is very similar karmically speaking that when you're in the present moment and you're learning how to be in, a, in alignment or in service to our divine original source, then it, it is as though a different kind of intelligence takes over and starts guiding your life. One of the things that is often said in the yoga tradition is that when one starts practicing yoga, it is as though the karma of their life, which is like a fan, and the fan is just turning. The blades are turning over and over and over again, right? So you have uh, you you have the blades of the fan going. It's like your karma. It's just and it's powered by your desires for more material outcomes. So like, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? I go and get it. I go and get it, and then actions, consequences, actions, and it just goes like that, round and round and round. Um, when you start linking up, you know, sort of start linking up becoming aware that you're not, you're, you're, you're a free agent and this material space is uh, a reflection of a spiritual space. You start, when you start recognizing that and you start linking in and seeing your divine self as a, as a spark uh, emanating from the divine whole and you start asking that source, connecting with it directly in your heart and asking it to guide your life and communing with it, loving it, in, inviting it in, it's as though what happens is the fan gets unplugged from the wall. The blades are going to keep turning for a while because it was going 90 miles an hour, right? So it's going to take a while for the blades to start slowing down. But first of all, when we start committing to a spiritual path, it's as though the plug is being pulled out. And it, the, the commitment, it, um, I don't know what that moment is that actually pulls it out. It's just a metaphor. But um, it's said in different traditions that the commitment, like in certain forms of Buddhism, the commitment can be as simple as having one, just one honest moment of realizing that it's all a sham and of seeking something greater. Even if it's a mental moment of just once being like, yeah, that's true. That's the moment. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, I've heard people say it like that. It's, it's the one time. That's why in most of the different traditions, yes, there's spiritual work that you have to do, but there's also this element of grace where it's a process that will start having a momentum of its own the very instant that you commit because the process is ultimately un, unboundedly merciful. And so uh, as soon as you decide you don't, you're, you don't want to be here, the intention is real and it's planted it's like, that's it. The, you know, it's like, it's unplugged. I want to go home. I want to be with, you know, I want to align myself with who I rec actually am as a spiritual being or whatever. Then, you know, the momentum stops. So that's one way of thinking about it. But then the other way of thinking about it is that you, um, 
as the you know as the blade is is slowing down and there's still karma to play out that you have choices that you're still making in the material realm that there's a momentum behind but because more and more of your choices are being guided by the intelligence of the spiritual world not the continuing continued spinning of the material world that the the spiritual intelligence starts running backward and forward in a sense through the the blades of the fan and so yes you can alter your your fate you can alter your karma you can alter whatever but um and so destiny is more of the word that we use when we've taken to a spiritual path and the divine is more directly intervening with the course that we take that doesn't mean that every single thing is wide open that doesn't mean that you still won't have faded events that you have to experience um it does mean that the quality of consciousness that you have while experiencing them can be vastly different. And that in itself can be the ultimate meaning of the difference between fate and destiny. At the end of the day, you may get an offender bender and you could call it fate. But if you're on a spiritual path, you call it destiny because it feels different. And that's what it means that the blades of the fan are no longer powered by the electricity. They, they have a different, there's a different intelligence guiding how you're relating to the spinning of those wheels. So, you can think about destiny as both the ability to possibly shift outcomes, but also as about the, the different quality of heart, mind, and spirit that's present when you're experiencing outcomes after the plant fan sort of been pulled out. So this is why one of my favorite prayers says, you know, in this process, you're not even really seeking enlightenment. You're not sitting here going like, oh, what an evil, nasty material world. How do I get out of here? What you're really doing is saying, um, all I want is unmotivated service to my divine original source, lifetime after lifetime, unmotivated, just ha give, me, give me some things to do here. And if I know that they're coming from my source, that's my bliss. I'm fine. I don't care if I'm in material place, spiritual place, like whatever, because then it, it's, you've spiritualized already. The concept for this in yoga is called the Jiva Mukta. It's someone who's awakened while they're still in the material world. So at any rate, I say that because sometimes people will say, I like destiny, not fate. You have to understand that you don't just, you don't just, you know, but one thing that destiny doesn't mean that you just get to change anything and everything is totally open, that the transit could just mean whatever it means based on like how badass you are spiritually or something. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like that. It doesn't, it doesn't also mean that nothing is negotiable, you know, either. It's, but de destiny is a word that we use to describe the way that our spiritual life starts interacting with the continued unfolding of our karmic life. And it's uh, often more of, a, of, a, of a, the way that consciousness is directed within the unfolding of karmic reality than it is about, you know, trying to manipulate. Sometimes people, again, they'll say, oh, I like destiny. And it, what they really mean is I like being in control. I like liking stuff. I like going after stuff that I want. And that's not destiny. That's actually more like fate. But people think it's destiny because, again, just like Mars, we don't realize that Mars isn't necessarily your free will as much as it is your appetites and, and desires often enough. So at any rate, I promised I'd say something about destiny. I almost forgot, so I thought I should. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Oh, the name of the book by my friend is Time Loops by Eric Wargo. Uh, really, really cool, interesting book. If you like things like precognition and, you know, um, psi stuff and stuff like that. So, um, cool. <clears throat> uh, don't think there's any new questions here. So, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, well, you all have a very nice day. Have a great weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you again um, next week. Take care, everyone. Bye.